Welcome back to the show. Well, today we're talking about civil liberties and what academics are calling the increasing managerial state in Canada. My guest is professor of law from Queen's University and executive director of Rights Probe, Bruce Party. Same rules and standards should apply to everyone without regard to who you are. In other words, justice should be blind. Our Supreme Court and other courts have said that the equality guarantee in the Charter, and there is one, it's been interpreted to mean equality of outcome between groups. A lot of Canadians, I think, are having trouble recognizing their own country. What is really going on? I thought I had legal rights, legal protections that don't seem to be working. There's a lot of explaining to do. You may have heard the saying, good times create weak men. Weak men create bad times. Bad times create strong men, and strong men create good times. Well, over the past years in Canada, it has become increasingly obvious that tough times have come to us on the issue of civil liberties and charter freedoms. The good news is that many men and women have arisen to push back and speak to the issues and for the freedoms that so many of us care about. A few examples, Jordan Peterson, former university of Toronto professor and clinical psychologist, now international academic celebrity, regularly speaking to freedom of conscience issues with courage. Trish Wood, former CBC journalist, has emerged with a very popular podcast speaking to the tough issues of our times, also with courage. More and more Canadians are turning to alternative media sources such as True North News, Rebel News, and the like. Add to this list of countercultural voices, my guest today, Bruce Party, has taught at law school in Canada, the United States, and New Zealand, practiced civil litigation at Borden, Ladner, Gervais, LLP in Toronto, and served as adjudicator and mediator on the Ontario Environmental Review Tribunal. He's also senior fellow at the Fraser Institute and is currently serving as the executive director of Rights Probe, along with being one of the creators of the Free North Declaration. He joins me today to discuss the state of our nation as it relates to civil liberties and what he he calls the increasing managerial state that we are experiencing as Canadians. Grab your notepad. This is a weighty conversation. I believe you will appreciate what he has to share. Thank you so much for joining me. Stick with us for the whole program. Let's get to it. Bruce Party, professor of law, now acting as the executive director of this organization, Rights Probe. I am so looking forward to this conversation today. Thank you so much for joining me. Oh, it's a pleasure. Thank you so much for inviting me to join you. Well, you are quite the study yourself, professor of law at Queen's University, reading the court across our nation on the issue of civil liberties. You decided to take a hiatus, as I understand it, from your uh, teaching position and have now jumped into this role with Rights Probe to speak to this important issue. Talk to us about the good work that you're doing with Rights Probe. Right. Thank you. Well, right, Rights Probe is a, basically a law and liberty think tank. It's a division of the Energy Probe Research Foundation, and it just seemed like the right time to do this because there's a lot of explaining to do. A lot of Canadians, I think, are having trouble recognizing their own country. And this was very much the case during COVID for a, for a lot of folks. And and the 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 experience was, you know, what 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 is really going on? I thought I had legal rights, legal protections that don't seem to be working. Why, why is that? What, what is going on? And the answer is that the, the, the culture first is shifting, but, but even more, maybe importantly for my purposes, the legal ground has been shifting underneath our feet for a long time, a long time, slowly. And COVID was a culmination of a whole lot of trends. And so it seemed like at a, a sudden thing that, that came upon us, but but the this, this kind of development has been in the works for a long time. I don't mean the virus now, but the response to it, the overwhelming, heavy-handed, authoritarian, unequal, irrational, and and expert-driven response to the to the COVID situation in so many ways 
which made no sense. And, and everybody could see the ways in which it made, made no sense. You know, inconsistent rules issued by people behind podiums at press conferences, contradicting themselves from what they said the week before. Um, anybody who was paying attention could see that it didn't make sense. And yet, and yet, the law allowed it to happen. And many of the challenges that would, were launched to these various kinds of measures, the lockdowns, the masking, the vaccine mandates, were, 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 were put aside by the courts, uh, sometimes for valid reasons, and sometimes, you know, you have to argue about that. Um, but but the, the, the bottom line is we are in a situation now where our country is being governed in a system that many people don't recognize. We are governed now by what I refer to as a managerial state. A managerial state is a heavy-handed, ubiquitous government that has departments and agencies and tribunals and, and bodies everywhere and has its hands in everything. It governs, it regulates, it supervises, it promotes, it taxes, it subsidizes, it drives the bus. And those people, those Canadians who, who live their lives with the legitimate expectation that they are the primary people who have control of what happens in their lives, are finding that that idea is being challenged by this managerial state who wants to direct us all on how to live. Now let's unpack that even a little bit more because you know you see what's being taught to many of our young people in post-secondary education in our universities right now. And many in the next generation would say like, why is that a bad thing? You know, don't like, shouldn't the government be taking care of anybody? Everybody, shouldn't the government be regulating, making sure that, you know, people's speech is managed so that they don't hurt other people and their feelings? Like, so talk to that person out there that maybe doesn't feel like the managerial state is all that bad of an idea. And a lot of people think this too, because they have grown up with it. We have a lot of people alive in Canada today who have known nothing else. And, and they believe, and quite genuinely, I think, that this is the job of government. The job of government is to tell us what to do. The, the alternative view of a government is that it should be there to keep the peace. That is, it should be there to make sure that people don't hurt each other, they don't use violence against each other, that people don't, you know, uh, um, go off the deep end in terms of violence or we don't have car accidents. And we, But it's a, it's a very limited thing. We sometimes call it the, the night watchman state as opposed to the managerial state. The night watchman state is a small contained kind of government that has very important things, police, courts, military, and, and such. But not, very little else. If you don't have a managerial state, then you have the ability to decide for yourself what your values are, what your decisions are going to be, whether or not you decide to get a vaccine, whether or not you want to wear a mask or not, and so on and so forth. In other words, the job of protecting yourself and deciding what's in your own best interest is you. And after all, there was no one else inside your head but you. Yeah, and this hits on so many levels, right? We could talk about parental rights. We could talk about physician conscience rights. We could talk about students and their experiences on the campuses with their preferences. And, you know, there's so many directions you could go along this. But why? It extends to every single little thing, everything you've listed and more and more and more. Everything in your life, first and foremost, is up to you. And, and we have displaced that idea. And so the reason, as I understand it, that you flag the managerial state as being so problematic is because it just eventually over time leads to the crushing of the individual uh, under the, the commanded submission to whatever the ideology of the, the governing policymakers of the day happens, happens to be. And today that, that happens to be what is sometimes called a progressive worldview or, or if you like a woke worldview, that worldview has a number of characteristics. And in my opinion, detrimental ones. Like, for example, this progressive ideology is based on the idea that your your rights and entitlements depend upon the identity that you have, racial, sexual, and otherwise. But we have lost this idea. This is a core legal idea that everybody thinks is still in place, but it actually is, is, is fading away, which is this, that the same rules and standards should apply to everyone without regard to who you are. In other words, justice should be blind. In Canada, that cannot be assumed to be true. 
because over the course of decades, our Supreme Court and other courts have said that the, the equality guarantee in the charter, and there is one, there's an equality guarantee in the charter, but it does not now guarantee equality of treatment under the law. It doesn't mean that the same rules and standards apply to everybody. It's been interpreted to mean equality of outcome between groups. That means when the government puts out a job ad, the government is allowed to say no white males shall apply. That is constitutional. How is that not discrimination on the basis of race? Exactly. Exactly so. That is discrimination, but that's the kind of discrimination that the Charter and the Human Rights Codes now allow because we have lost the idea of equal treatment under the law. Wow. Stunning. And so the spirit and intent of the Constitution is basically kind of being thrown out the window because when you look at our charter and it states there that, you know, one of our fundamental rights is um, equal treatment under the law, you're now saying that because of the equal outcome focus, uh, there's been a reinterpretation of the charter, which means, uh, you know, a, a difference on the application of the law. Yes. And you could say that generally about the charter uh, in, in many different respects. So the charter, if you read it, the charter reads like a roster of individual rights and freedoms. And that's the way it was conceived in my view. But slowly over time, that charter has been, if you like, reimagined or reinterpreted uh, under through, through a, a progressive lens so as to justify curbing or reimagining those rights so as to justify curbing them in the name of a particular version of the common good. And the equality guarantee is just one of those examples. So just articulate clearly like a four dummies type, <laughs> type response here. Why is this a bad thing, Bruce? The, the big reason is it means you're no longer an independent person and you cannot, depend, you cannot count on being treated neutrally by the authorities, whether they be governments or legislatures or courts. It means that, that those decision makers are going to bring to your situation what they think is the proper outcome. So if they think that you shouldn't be entitled to apply for that job, even though you're qualified, you might be the most qualified person, but you're not allowed to apply for it because of the color of your skin. That is exactly the opposite idea that, that, that civil rights people have been fighting for forever. I mean, Martin Luther King Jr. was the one who said we should assess people by the content of their character not by the color of their skin. Well, today, if you said that, you would be called a, you would be called a racist. Unless we step back in and say, you know what? This is not being done with the consent of the governed, and we don't consent to this, and please stop this, then it's just gonna carry on and get worse. We believe in giving back and doing all that we can do to build a better future. What that means is that when you partner with Faith Team TV, you are partnering with so much more than an issues commentary show. You are partnering with a team that is constantly pouring out to serve Canadians and pray for them and their loved ones through special TV programming and our phone lines as well. You are partnering with at-risk youth through the children that we sponsor every single month and programs we actively partner with like the World Embrace Champions Centre and Children's Park in Gulu, Uganda. You are partnering with national prayer events where we gather believers from sea to sea in united prayer for Canada. You're partnering with the Life Room, which has already mobilized thousands of hours of prayer for the unborn in our nation, and with the Justice Wall, which mobilizes prayer for issues such as human trafficking, youth suicide, conscience and faith freedom, and for good government in Canada. One person is a voice, but together we are a powerful force that can do so much good. Thank you for your support of Fate Teen TV, and thank you for being a part of this team. Together, we truly can leave the world better for the sake of future generations. We appreciate you, and every gift really makes a difference. Let's talk about some of the real high-profile situations in our nation right now. Obviously, you've got the Jordan Peterson case, right, where he's mm -hmm. being told basically that he has to be re-educated on his social media behavior at his own expense for an undetermined amount of time. But then on the other side, you've got our prime minister who uh, has had blackface, doesn't know how many times uh, he had blackface, um, you know, s several situations that could be considered racist and sexist, um, you know, his own cabinet ministers that are no 
longer his cabinet ministers calling him out on these things. And yet there's this there's this disparity in how uh, people on the right or people on the left seem yes. to be yeah. being treated. Talk yes. about yeah. that for a moment. Maybe the yes. Jordan Peterson yes. case. Give us your read on it. Well, that's that's I think that's very true what you say. And, and the reason it's happening is that that's the design. That is the design. It's not an accident. This is a design. We are going to encourage and forgive and 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 promote mo movements from the left, and we are going to crush movements from the right, even if they're not violent. So Jordan Peterson, who's been associated with the with the right, and because he's saying things that are contrary to a progressive narrative, therefore it, it is legitimate. And this is the regulator doing this. It seemed to be legitimate to shut him down, but. Other kinds of, 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 of statements and behavior on the left side of the spectrum, like you mentioned from, from Justin Trudeau, well, it gives a, gets a pass because after all, he's, you know, he's spouting the right kind of, of rhetoric. Those Canadians who are assuming that the law has an even hand, the authorities have an even hand, that everything's supposed to be consistent from one thing to the other and the law is supposed to be blind, those assumptions Ne don't n do not necessarily apply now in this country. Th th this is a kind of, and I and I don't use these terms lightly, but this is a f this is leading us to a form of totalitarianism where the authorities will tell you your worth based upon your skin color, your sex, your gender, and other characteristics that are supposed to have nothing to do with your with your legal rights. It is a terrible, terrible place to be. Now, Bruce, I'm going to make a positive assumption about you here. So obviously you are giving your time, your talent, your focus into expounding this, explaining this for Canadians, getting it on people's radar in a way that they understand the gravity of it. You know, you could have just walked over the boundary line and moved to Costa Rica, right? And said, okay, I see where this, where this could be going. I'm just going to relocate. So obviously you're staying in the, in the dialogue because you believe that there's hope to make an impact. Um, there's been a trajectory, yes, but how does this thing get turned around with where we're at right now in 2023? It's a very good question, a very difficult question to answer definitively. Uh, there's no silver bullet, there's no one plan, but what, what has to happen, I think, is that a critical mass of Canadians have to just say no. We, we do not approve of this. We're not going along with it. We're not going to mouth it. We're not going to, to pretend to go along with it, even though we don't agree. I've spoken to an awful lot of people, an awful lot of people who, who sense there's something not right and do not, in fact, agree with the, 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 you know, the prevailing narrative out there in the public square. And yet they sometimes feel that they... They can't say so because they'll be shamed or accused of something awful like like being a racist or, or the like. You know what? If everybody who thought that spoke up and said, no, actually, I don't agree, then suddenly the, the landscape would look a lot different. This is the kind of moment that we're in. We need people to be brave now because your country is at stake. And you need to find it within yourself, the courage to simply say out loud what it is you think to your family, to your friends, you know, those people who have the wherewithal uh, to, to, to go further than that, you know, to run for election to your school board or the like in, in any big or small way to add your voice to the group that says the path that we're on is not a good one. We, we have to stop and think about this. Yeah, one of my mentors, I don't know if you would know the, the name of this individual, David Maines, he's now passed on, but he used to say that the nation goes to those who show up to the meetings. That's <laughs> so. right. That's right. And, you know, it, I think and that's, very, that's, that's a very good point. Like, it's understandable in a way that the people who don't agree with this are not the ones who show up to meetings because the people who show up to the meetings were the busybodies, you know, the ones who wanted to tell all the people what to do. And you know, it was a nuisance. And, and who wants to go to these meetings? There's just too much talking. And, and it's totally understandable. I feel that way too. But the problem is because everybody stayed away, the activist types took over the meetings and took over the institutions. 
And unless we step back in and say, you know what? This is not being done with the consent of the governed, and we don't consent to this, and please stop this, then it's just going to carry on and, 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 and get worse. Well, I, I love the hope that you bring in. It's, you know, you're really articulating the silent view of the masses, I believe. And as the masses just start to show up at those town hall meetings, a, a lot can happen um, and show up in other places as well, obviously. So let's talk um, about some of the other high profile, excuse me, cases that we're staring down right now in our nation. There's the Peckford case, right, that was thrown out. I'd love to get your thoughts on that whole situation from a law perspective. Obviously, what's happening with Josh Alexander here. Um, in Ontario. Um, anything else that's really on your radar or can you speak to either of those situations? As I alluded to at the beginning, this is a cultural thing, but it's also a legal thing. And those two things are very tightly connected. We, we can talk about any of those things. The, the, the situation during COVID has been that the courts have more or less, and it's not across the board because every judge is different. They have their own minds. But, but, but the trend has been that the courts have embraced the government's COVID narrative. And uh, lots of cases have been brought to challenge various aspects of those measures, like the Peckford case against the travel restrictions. And, and most of those have been defeated, thrown out uh, by courts. And, and in some situations, courts have gone so far as to take judicial notice of things that are in dispute. Now, judicial notice is a mechanism by which a court can find a fact as true without evidence. But it's not designed to be used in a situation where facts are in dispute. You know, for example, you know, the sky is blue. Well, no one wants to spend judicial resources on evidence about whether the sky is blue or not. So they just take judicial notice of the fact that the sky is blue because everybody agrees the sky is blue. But if you have a dispute in a case, for example, between divorced parents about whether a child should be vaccinated, whether the vaccination is safe, is a fact and dispute. And what some courts have been doing is taking judicial notice of the fact that the vaccine is safe and effective for children, even though that's the matter that was in question. So in, in that respect and, and in others, the courts have been taking shortcuts or, or other means to, to, to come to the conclusion that the government narrative is, is correct, even though they haven't gone through the process of assessing the evidence. Now, in, in, in the Josh Alexander case, which is not a COVID situation at all, Josh is a, as a, is, as you will know, is a is a high school student who objected to having um, boys claiming to be girls in the girls' washroom, and the and the, uh, the 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 school disagreed and and suspended Josh for saying this and for proposing a you know a school walkout and in and, and protest and that kind of thing. And the interesting thing about this situation is that although it appears to be about transgenderism and some respects it is, of course, but it's more about speech. What happened to Josh is he expressed an opinion, and that opinion was contrary to the narrative of the institution, and the institution said, essentially, you're not allowed to say this, you're not allowed in school. And we should be very concerned about this example, and it's just one example, of a situation where public authority is not allowing people to express opinions that are contrary to what the institution wants to be the case. The, the idea of living in a free country is now at risk. Well, and of course, all of these cases and scenarios are so critical because they can be precedent setting, right, for cases to come. Sure. Um, any good news, Bruce, on the civil liberties front that you see? Any good momentum where you're seeing some wins? Uh, momentum, no, but let me try and put the COVID thing in as best a light as I can. And, and with these other things as well. We, you, know, we've, you referred to the Peterson situation with the College of Psychologists. Uh, and just to fill that in, the college is trying to requ require Peterson to undergo retraining in the use of his social media, which, which, is, uh, which is to laugh. The image of Trump trying to retrain Jordan Peterson on, 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 on how to express himself is, is, is ridiculous. The situation that, that we, we are having across the board is that, that institutions of all different kinds are deciding that they have the authority to, to manage our speech. This is especially the case with professionals. With Peterson, it is the case with lawyers with the Law Society of Ontario. It is the case with the medical regulators during COVID who basically said to doctors, you may not express your medical opinion 
about official government policy. You may, you may not express or anti-lockdown or anti-masking or, or anti-mandate views, even if those views are based upon your medical knowledge. And when, when you get this accumulation of authorities across the board adopting this very heavy-handed ideological approach to determining whether or not someone is entitled to practice a profession or go to high school, you know, you, 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 you know you're in a pickle. But back, back to the silver lining thing. The silver lining in all of this, they hopefully have reached too far. They have shown their hand. They've shown what they're really about. And more Canadians than ever, I hope, are able to see now what is going on. This kind of thing's been happening for a while. But it's only in the past, you know, three years or so with COVID and other things that are coming down the pipes where I hope it's apparent what's happening. And and this is partly why we are able to have these kinds of conversations now, because people are alive to the problem. And that is the first step of any solution. You've got to have people who understand that there's a problem. If the the behavior of authorities of all kinds over the past three years or so has not shown us that we have a real problem, then I'm not sure what will. So much gravity in in all of those words. Thank you so much for everything that you've shared. I actually neglected to mention at the onset that you are a regular contributor to the National Post. You have articles that have been posted in the Financial Post. And so I want to say to all of our viewers here right now, if this is the first time that you have encountered Professor Bruce Party, you got to check out this organization, rightsprobe.org. A lot of his articles are posted there. Articles from some of his colleagues as well articulated on some of the same tiers here. I'm as I'm assuming that you also have an email list where people can sign up to be tracking with you. But before we have to land this plane today, Bruce, any final words for our viewers today? Take hope, because the more we do this, the, 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 the more you do this, um, the, the, the better off we are. The fact that we have so many people tuning in to these kinds of conversations and people who are who are alive to these issues, you know, that is the sign of hope. You you are you are not alone. The numbers are growing. So let's carry on. Oh, well put. Thank you so much for your time today. Really hope to have you back. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. We hope you appreciated today's program. We sure appreciate your engagement on these important conversations. If you want to watch this show again or share it with your friends and loved ones, simply visit our website, faithteen.tv, where you can find this show as well as other previous episodes for your viewing ease. Also want to remind you that we've got that free smartphone app and our email list on our website. If you download the app or sign up for our emails, you'll be notified each time a new program is aired so that you never miss a show. Thanks again to our monthly partners, our faithful donors, Owners as a nonprofit TV show, you know it. You're the ones that have kept us on air for the last several years, and you continue to keep us at it. So thank you. If you'd like to sign up to become a monthly partner or give a special gift today, we would be so grateful. Every amount, no matter how big or small, makes a massive difference and keeps us going. Simply go to fateen.tv or give us a call at 1-866-844-0844, and our team would be honored to serve you in any way that we can and even pray for your personal needs. Thanks again for being here. Hope to see you next week.